want to be recorded. There you go. We're all set to go. So if you'd like to start, Ed, um, go ahead. And if anybody has any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll um, talk about them later. Or we can, once Ed's finished, we'll take um, a round of questions. Good. Thanks very much. Excellent. So thank you very much for the invite and uh, your time today, or if you're looking at it on the uh, recording. I'm going to be talking about some of the intercropping research that we're doing at Harper Adams as part of three different projects. Um, the Crop Diva, which I'll explain in a, in a couple of minutes, and uh, two projects on strip cropping. So without further ado, I will... Uh, on to the next one. So a bit about the Crop Diva project. It is a Horizon 2020 project uh, led by Ghent University. And we're trying to increase diversity on European farms by bringing back six underutilized crops, including hullus or naked barley, which is what I'm primarily interested in. But we're also looking at in-field diversity. So we're looking at intercropping and also looking at um, small landscape elements. So different mixtures of flowers and um, grasses and things like that. Um, that's been looked at by uh, Nikki Randall and Todd Jenkins here at Harper Adams. But I'm gonna talk about very, very briefly a bit on naked barley because um, that's my primary interest, and I'm, I'm um, so I'm all you're never going to get away without um, a bit about naked barley, and then about intercropping what intercropping is, what are some of the advantages, and what are some of the problems as well. First of all, naked barley naked barley is barley primarily for human food. On the slide here, we've got some hulled barley. If you're going to eat barley, you've got to pearl it. So you're going to remove the hull, which is inedible, and you end up with pearl barley. Unfortunately, you've removed some of the some of the goodness, some of the bran. And if you're going to eat if you're going to eat barley, naked or hullless barley is the preferred preferred type. And we've been breeding barley to reduce the quantity of beta glucan for malting. But if you're going to eat it, you want higher beta glucan because it's got some very, very useful health of benefits. For example, reducing uh, cholesterol and also slowing down the release of glucose into your bloodstream. So you feel satisfied for longer after you've um, eaten um, some barley porridge, for example. So barley beta glucan is a very, very useful compound and we're, as part of Crop Diva, we're looking at over 300 different accessions of uh, barley from around the world, all naked barley, and seeing which has got the highest levels of beta lucan and other useful, other useful compounds in there. But what we're going to talk about mainly today is using naked barleys as part of the intercropping. So the type of intercropping that we're going to be looking at first is mixed intercropping. Um, for those of you who haven't come across intercropping before, intercropping is very simply growing two or more crops together in the same field at the same time. So usually in agriculture, we implement diversity over time in the form of a rotation. But with intercropping, we're keeping both crops together at the same time. A mixed intercrop is where they're just mixed together, sown at the same time, harvested at the same time. We also have a look at strip intercropping um, in, a, in a few minutes. The experiments that we're doing as part of Crop Diva are using hullless barley or naked barley in different um, amounts, different ratios with peas. We're also doing some experiments with oats and peas as well, um, but I'm going to be presenting the, the barley data um, because that's, that's the most interesting at the moment. The fundamental experiment the, that we've been running for two years now and we're planning to drill as soon as we can for this year, for a third year, uh, will be 
using the naked barley in two different intercropping rates. So 50-50, where each component is grown at 50% of their normal seed rate. So our, our normal seed rate for barley would say for 400 seeds per square meter. So the 50-50 would have 200 seeds of barley per square meter. And then the peas would be usually around about 70 to 90 seeds per square meter. So 50% of that. And the 50-50 mix is at first sight the obvious one to go for, both components at, at half rate. And then we've got a, a mix which we thought would be optimised better for the peas, where the cereal is at 30% rate and the pea at 100% rate. And that's as a factorial experiment with five types of hullless barley, and they differ in their height and competitiveness. And last year we replaced one of the hullless barley types with um, laureate as a as a better control um, so we've got five types of barley as sole crops and as intercrops the intercrops and the sole crops all got um, nitrogen at about 30 percent of the normal rate and then there's also sole crop barley with um, nitrogen at 100 percent of the normal rate as a as a standard or a, a setting control This is a, uh, a drone picture of our, of our intercropping trials last year, so um, in 2023. The much larger area is the barley and pea trial, and then to the right of it, you've got the oat and pea trial, um, a smaller trial looking also darker green. You see it was a very, very impressive field trial, as well as having the varieties, we also had smaller trials embedded within it with different nitrogen rates and fungicide and no fungicide treatment. This is a, a bit more of a close up. So the, these were drone pictures taken by my colleague, um, Andrew Watson here at Harper Adams. And you can see the plot at the top is sole crop peas and then we have a 50 50 and then we have a 30 percent cereal 100 percent peas and then we have a um, sole crop barley and on this photo you can see that the sole crop peas are looking greener and that's one thing we certainly found when you're doing intercropping is the two components tend to synchronize together in terms of maturity so the peas in the intercropping experiment are maturing a bit faster than the peas in the pea sole crop. And we think that's probably due to the ethylene being given up as, it, as one component starts to ripen. Um, we find that effect if you're doing varietal blends as well. People say, oh, well, you can't do varietal blends because they've got different times of maturity. Well, they tend to mature at the same time as long as the differences aren't too extreme. I'm going to be talking a bit when we're discussing yields in terms of land equivalent ratio. So this is a, a measurement often used in intercropping experiments. And this is the area of land required of the combined two separate crops to get the same yield as a hectare of intercrop. So I've got a, a made up example here. If we've got sole crop wheat, 10 tonnes per hectare, good crop of winter wheat, and you've got sole crop beans with five tonnes the hectare. And that's a very good crop of, of beans. If your intercrop yields six tonnes the hectare of wheat and three tonnes the hectare of beans, that's 0.6 of the sole crop yield. So the two added together, 0.6 plus 0.6 is 1.2. So you've got a land equivalent ratio of 1.2. So to grow the two separate crops, you'd have to have a total of 1.2 hectares to get the same yield of one hectare of the intercrop. You don't always get a land equivalent ratio of greater than one. And where you do, then we consider that the intercropping has been successful. I will say one word of warning though, the combined yield of stuff from the intercrop there is six tons plus three tons. So you're still, still getting less crop only nine tons versus the sole crop wheat. 
So just because you get a land equivalent ratio of greater than one doesn't mean you're actually yielding more material per hectare. What do we find? For the barley variety and intercropping experiment run over two years now, we found there was a significant effect of intercropping on barley yield. Not surprising when we sow barley at a lower seed rate and the peas are in there competing with it, we're going to lose some of the yield. So that wasn't particularly surprising. What was interesting was in both yields, in both years we had an interaction between variety and intercropping. And we'll come on to that in a minute. So we pulled out two varieties. These are both naked barleys that I've bred. Uh, these aren't official names. You won't find these on the recommended list. But Oak Ruby is a pure line selection. Um, and Planet S6 is a, a half sibling of Ruby crossed with Planet, which is known to be quite a, a vigorous variety. And where we were getting this interaction between variety and intercropping, if you look at the data for Ruby, first of all, you can see as the intercropping um, is used, you're losing some of the barley yield, quite a lot of barley yield, especially when you've got the 30, 100. So 30% of the normal barley seed rate, 100% of the normal pea seed rate. Whereas Planet S6 holds on to its yield, it maintains its yield even when grown as an intercrop. So you can see a smaller drop in yield of Planet S6 versus um, the Oak Ruby. And Planet S6, the characteristics of this variety tended to be a better tiller, producing more tillers, more vigorous, slightly taller, but not very much taller, but certainly a, a higher biomass variety. When we looked at pea yield in 2022, we had a significant effect of barley variety on the pea yield. So some varieties of barley suppressed the pea yield more than others. And unsurprisingly, it was the Oak Ruby that supported the highest yield of peas. And it was Planet S6, which supported one of the lowest yields of peas. We didn't get a significant result in 2023. But this was a very difficult year uh, for a number of weather reasons. First of all, it was raining a lot in March. We didn't sow anything until the middle of April. We then didn't get any rain for the first 10 weeks. Um, so the barley, it was um, the ears were coming out below the level of the flag leaf and under a lot of drought stress. And then, of course, it started raining in July and hasn't stopped since. Um, so we had quite a a difficult year so we had quite high cvs so maybe that's a reason for not getting the significant results uh, that we did in 2022 when we compare the land equivalent ratios between the two varieties for the two years if we pick out um, planet s6 we see in both years it has the highest land equivalent ratio due to its higher proportion of barley. So the barley maintained its own yield as a proportion of the sole crop barley yield to a better extent than the other varieties did. And then not far behind it in total land equivalent ratio is Oak Ruby because it supported a higher yield of the peas. So in both years, it supported a high yield of peas. The P yields in 2023 were quite low. We also underestimated the P contribution to the land equivalent ratio because of the um, we had problems with the weather and they were late harvested. So we had to use hand harvested samples to calculate the P yields because a lot of the peas had shelled out by the time it was fit to get in the field. Um, so we've overestimated the pea sole crop yields in 2023 because we're recovering more of the peas than we would have done if we'd have been 
combining because combining peas is always a bit of a, a rescue operation. There were other advantages to the um, pea intercropping. For example, in both years, the pea sole crops lodged completely. So by harvest, they were 100% lodged and we had a lot of stones picked up in the in the sample, so a very poor sample. And in both years, the intercrop plots remained 100% standing. So you've got a couple of pictures there from 2022 and you formed a really good 3D basket work where the barley was doing a really excellent job of supporting the peas. And in that really difficult harvest that we had last year, the pea intercrops would have been harvestable a week or two after the sole crop peas were too badly lodged and shelled out to be uh, recoverable. So you do build in some weather resilience uh, by intercropping and helping support the peas. We also looked at weed competition. Uh, my PhD student, Ashley, he had an excellent idea of using the Canopio app to measure ground cover once we'd taken the biomass samples. So once you've taken the quadrat sample, you're left with the weeds on the stubble. And he found that the weed cover in the sole crop peas was by far the worst. The intercrop uh, ground cover of weeds was only about half that of the pea sole crop. And the ground cover of weeds in the barley sole crop was only about a third of that in the pea sole crop. So the peas really weren't very competitive against weeds. The barley is very competitive against weeds. So when you intercrop them, you get fewer weeds in the intercrop than you would the barley sole crop, the pea sole crop, but more than the barley sole crop. So that was another useful finding because the, the number of herbicides that we can use on peas and beans has been rapidly reduced as well. And we did have a bad weed problem last year with the very dry conditions early on, um, not helping the residuals to work. And then a lot of rain later on and a real big flush of weeds in June and July. We did a smaller experiment on nitrogen rates for intercropping. Where we just used oak ruby because we know that's a good companion for the peas. And we applied zero, 30 kilograms and 100 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen to the um, sole crop barley and to the sole crop and to the um, intercrops, but not to the peas. Obviously, you don't want to be applying nitrogen to peas. So 100 kilograms per hectare was uh, the RB209 recommendation for this situation. So we wanted to know what would be the effect of uh, applying nitrogen to an intercrop because people are just having to be going on guesswork. And what we found was that as you increase the nitrogen rate, you get a higher yield of barley. That's not unexpected, but the yield of the peas in the intercrops declined quite considerably. And we think what was happening there was that we we're increasing the competitiveness of the barley, so it's outcompeting the peas. Um, so here we have the the land equivalent ratios for the intercrops. So this is the 50, 50 and the 30, 100 as an average. So the two intercrops taken as an average for 100, 30 and zero. Um, at 100, we've got a lower land equivalent ratio, less than one. Bear in mind, we actually had a higher yield of barley. We're comparing the land, when you're calculating the land equivalent ratio, you use the yield of the sole crop barley at the equivalent rate of nitrogen. So this is the yield of the barley in the intercrop as a percentage of the sole crop barley that's had 100 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen was used to calculate that. One thing from this is that a lot of the intercropping research that has been done has been done with either very, very low inputs or organically. And you can see where you're not applying nitrogen, then you do get a big advantage from the intercropping 
uh, the highest land equivalent ratio zero nitrogen but that doesn't mean you get more yield because the the barley yield was lower overall at the zero nitrogen not unexpectedly also did a a few side projects looking at winter peas and intercropping so this is one of the, the first intercropping experiment that i did we used quite a high seed rate of barley 20350 and in both cases that was too high a seed rate of barley and it outcompeted the winter peas the winter peas were very low yielding uh, a mean of only 0.3 tons per hectare not just because of the intercropping i don't think this variety was particularly suitable for our climate but you can see here the intercropping decreased the yield of the barley and it wasn't compensated for by getting the the yield of the peas because that was very low so if you are considering intercropping if you reduce the if you don't reduce the seed rate of the cereal component by enough you end up with very very low yields of the legume and but you're still reducing the yields of the of the barley we had another go with um, the winter peas this time combining them with winter all-seed rape because uh, people have done it successfully with spring all-seed rape and spring peas so we had a go at um, a, a winter mix where it's done with springs it's sometimes called peola as in peas plus canola uh, this was very successful at first. This was in uh, autumn 2022, which was very, very mild. It was sown in September, I think about September the 14th. It grew very, very quickly in the mild autumn. Uh, the peas were looking very good. And they were actually, they had less pigeon grazing on the plots that had peas in them because they were denser and they were difficult to land. But then it came cold very, very quickly, and we had a cold snap in December, and that killed off a lot, a lot of the top growth of those winter peas. They'd grown too quickly. Uh, they did tend to regenerate a bit from the base, but once they were small, then the pigeons were moving in. So it needs a bit more work um, with winter peas, I think. We did have some plots that were drilled later. They were drilled at the beginning of November and they looked miserable all the way through the winter, but they didn't have that dieback because they were growing very small over winter to growing along the ground. So they looked miserable and then they recovered quite well and they were the most successful plots of winter peas. So maybe winter peas don't want to be drilled um, too early, especially in our climate where it may be mild over winter, followed by um, a cold snap. So to summarize our findings from mixed intercropping is that some competition appears to be unavoidable when you're doing mixed intercropping because you've got to sow and harvest both components at the same time they're going to be using resources at the same time and their components are going to compete with each other and traits that allow the barley to maintain higher yields do suppress the peas where we have a more competitive variety like that planet s6 it maintains its own yield but suppresses the peas if you use a higher seed rate of the barley it suppresses the peas if you apply nitrogen you get a higher yield of the barley but again then the barley suppresses the peas and you get a lower yield if you're going to be using land equivalent ratio to evaluate combinations, you need to be careful because as we saw in that example with the planet S6, the barley was maintaining its own yield, so it did have a high LER overall, but it was suppressing the peas quite badly. So if you're using LER and picking the, the combinations that give you the best LER, you may need to consider what what component are you most interested in are you wanting to grow the best yield of uh, peas in which case choose a less competitive variety lower seed rate don't put so much nitrogen on it or are you wanting to maximize the barley if you're wanting to maximize the barley unfortunately the findings are that 
it's probably best to grow it as a sole crop and apply RB209 recommendations a full rate of nitrogen. What we did find is we had a very useful suppression of weeds and reduced lodging and an easier harvest where we were using intercropping. Those are all real bad problems with peas. So if you're wanting to grow peas primarily, including barley at a reduced rate, say 30%, should get you an easier harvest and better quality of the peas. There are some positives and some negatives from mixed intercropping. So this was all done as part of the Prop Diva project. I'd like to move on to strip intercropping. So strip intercropping is still growing several crops in the same field, but they are organized into strips. Um, sometimes described as a structured plant team, whereas mixed intercropping is an unstructured plant team. So here you avoid some of the competition and you can harvest, you can sow separately, you can apply sprays separately. This is an example from the USA where strip cropping is being done to manage um, erosion. So you've got winter oats there that have been already harvested and they would have hold, held the soil together on that slope over the winter. One advantage that you're getting from strip cropping over mixed cropping is you break away from that competition problem so the oats when they were growing when they were using resources the soybeans and the maize either hadn't been sown yet or was very very small because oats are ma making most use of resources in sort of april may so the oats on the edge of the strips they're getting an edge effect they're getting more light more nutrients and so they should be over yielding. So potentially, if each strip over yields because it's getting temporal complementarity, potentially a situation like this, you'd expect a third of the field from each of the three crops, but maybe if you're getting 40% yield out of each crop, that would give you a land equivalent ratio of 1.2. So strip cropping has been done it's been done traditionally in China, but what has been found is that as the strips get wider, you start to lose the advantage because you're getting um, a lower proportion of edge rows versus the centers. If you're going to use narrow machinery, it's not really economic if you're going to pay somebody to drive a little tractor up and down the field. So that's where we came in with um, the hands-free hectare project, which has been running at Harper Adams University since 2017. The idea behind hands-free hectare was that over the years, agricultural machineries get ever larger. It's got larger and larger, more and more compaction, economies of scale, larger machines need, f need fewer drivers, cover more acreage. But as the machines get larger, they cause more problems of compaction, they're obviously a lot more expensive, that's um, becoming more and more of a problem in agriculture. And you're also getting lower resolution if you're trying to do precision farming, and your resolution is the width of a very large combine, your yield maps don't give you as much information as they potentially could do. So if we're going to truly implement precision farming, we need smaller machines. So that was the idea of the hands free hectare. So the Heinz Free Hectare set out to use smaller machines, but more of them, to farm instead of uh, one larger machine. So over the last 60 years, we've, had, we've started off with lots of horses. They've been replaced by small tractors, and then the tractors have been replaced by ever larger tractors, but ever smaller numbers. So we're going to go back to having more, but smaller machines. So the idea of the hands-free hectare was a hectare of land was farmed autonomously using adapted machinery, a little Ezeki tractor, which incidentally is a similar power, similar weight to an old uh, a T20, your old grey Fergie. So not causing 
as much damage to the soil as a grey Fergie because you've actually got better tyres, modern, modern tyres. So the idea was using a lot less, a lot less damage to the soil, using smaller machines and farm an area of a hectare completely autonomously. That was done in 2017 and 2018. And then that was upscaled to the hands-free farm, starting off in the autumn of 2019, which was a really wet autumn. And then of course, COVID happened, but that project ran for three years and they farmed 35 hectares completely autonomously using the hands-free hectare equipment. When that project came to an end, we were thinking, could we do something a bit more using that technology? And so the logical thing to do, the logical next step was to combine the hands-free hectare technology with strip cropping. So we used the autonomous vehicles, an adapted Izeki tractor and a small combine, which is a, a class crop tiger, a little rice combine on tracks. So they harvest, they sow, they spray two meter strips. So with two meter wide strips, quite a large proportion of the field is edges. So you get those edge rows. And so we did it last year, spring cropping with spring barley, spring beans, spring wheat in strips. And all the operations were done autonomously. Because once you can program a robot to drive up and down the field, just going back on itself, you can program it to do individual strips rather than just monocropping. So once again, we were affected by the weather. The, we had a lot of rain in March 23 and we didn't get anything drilled until towards the end of April when it was very, very dry. But we successfully drilled and got the, the crops established. And you see it went in straight after a maize crop that had been in there um, the previous autumn. So you can see some effects of the, uh, the drought there, but you can also see the strips were established relatively successfully. And by June, they were looking pretty good. So we had a, a half decent crop of spring wheat, spring beans and spring barley. Because of the late rain, we had a flush of weeds, especially in the beans. We couldn't do anything about the beans because um, there's nothing for broadleaf weeds that could be applied uh, post emergence but we could use herbicide in the barley and in the wheat. Um, it was a bit of a, a frightening process when we decided to go for it and spray the wheat and the barley and hopefully not kill the beans. Before we did it, we had a trial run with just water in the tank and put down some water sensitive paper in the bean rows uh, to see how much um, how much drift there was going to be. Thankfully, there wasn't, it was acceptable. So we, we had a go and applied a herbicide to the, to the cereals. And that was pretty successful. And we didn't kill the beans, which was the main thing. So we demonstrated that it's possible to apply separate products to different strips. That's a major problem with mixed intercropping. For example, when you've got oats and peas, there are no herbicides that you can use on that combination at all. Peas and barley, you've got pendomethylin pre-emergence and that's about it. And then when we came to harvest, this is where uh, the spring wheat has been harvested. You can see the barley next to it, which is quite badly brackled. This is because we ended up having to harvest everything in September. The original plan was that the crops would mature at different times. Um, but because of the, the weather, we just had one opportunity in, in late September. We had a very impressive degree of precision. There were no beans, for example, in the wheat sample. Um, so there was an incredible degree of precision to drive along that strip 
and not be clipping neighbouring strips. That gets rid of one major disadvantage with mixed intercropping is unless you're going to use it for animal feed, you need to clean out the separate components. So you've obviously got a, a cost there and a, a, also a cost in time and hassle. And what some people have found is that even the, if you're getting a, a positive land equivalent ratio from mixed intercropping, the cost of cleaning out, for example, um, sieving out peas out of barley um, soon eliminates that, that advantage. And certainly in 2022, when it was very, very hot, we had a lot of split peas, which we couldn't uh, clean out of the barley. So we've given it another go. Uh, this autumn, we drilled the same combination. The plan was winter wheat, winter barley and winter beans. So the winter barley and the winter wheat went in as planned and then had a lot of rain on it afterwards. The winter beans never got drilled. We've now switched to spring beans, but they haven't been drilled yet either because it's still very wet. But you can see the uh, not bad establishments, um, certainly to start off with. The ends of the plots, unfortunately, ground um, because we had a lot of rain in October and that didn't do things any good at all. And then coming into the spring, we've just had a very, very wet winter. And you can see the end, the corner of the experimental site has been lost uh, due to extreme water logging. But we've got a big enough area um, to get some reasonably interesting results so far. And the second year uh, agriculture with crop management students out there taking samples from the edge rows and the inside rows. And we found that unfortunately it's not statistically significant, so the p-value of 0 0.08, uh, but there were higher biomass per plant in the edge rows. And interestingly, the barley edge rows neighbouring the wheat and the wheat edge rows neighbouring the barley will both had higher biomass than the centre rows. So we may be getting some sort of competition effect happening there. So we've got some students who are going to be taking some results a bit later and see if we're going to carry on with that trend. We also found, and it was statistically significant, higher percentage nitrogen in the outer rows whether it was against the bare strips or against the other cereal. So that was for wheat and for barley. So we appear to be getting some sort of an effect. We're also doing a strip cropping project as part of an Innovate UK funded project uh, with Dale Holloway, who is a farmer from Derbyshire who is also an engineer and he's building his own robots. So he's designing and building robots to use specifically for strip cropping. Can't share um, pictures of the, the robots themselves, but there is slightly different design philosophy than the hands-free hectare, which was based on adapting existing material. But the, uh, the robot strip farming that we're gonna be sowing in um, this October, hoping that it's a bit drier than it was last October. We're going to be doing a, a strip cropping trial on his farm. And over the course of this spring and then next spring, a couple of colleagues of mine, uh, Ben and Paul, you can see they're setting up some, um, some traps, some pitfall traps and uh, the, uh, uh, the pan traps, doing a biodiversity audit of the fields where the strip cropping is going to be and then do another one next year and see what effect strip cropping has on biodiversity. That could be really important. Um, the ecologists will tell us that the really interesting things in ecology happen at the edges. So we're bringing the edges right into the middle of the field. So potentially we should see biodiversity benefits and Maybe even if we can make a case for having this as a SFI option or other equivalent schemes in uh, other parts of the UK. So potentially we could see increased yields, less use of pesticides and increased biodiversity. 
from strip cropping if we can make it uh, a success. Uh, finally, we've got a slightly different system based on similar sort of principles. And this was inspired, these are pictures from Indiana, um, Jason Merck, who uh, posts a lot of stuff on Twitter. And he's got a system he calls the constant canopy, where he grows relay cropping of wheat and soybean. So the wheat is autumn sown and then harvested in sort of late July. And the soybeans are sown in sort of May and harvested around about October. And it's got um, plastic guards on the combine knife, so it goes over the top of the soybean rows. And the wheat, when it's harvesting the wheat, so the wheat is able to bush out initially, so it's using resources in the early part of the year, in the spring. So you're getting higher yields from the edge rows. And then the soybean takes over after the wheat is harvested. And again, it bushes out, produces more pods on the edge rows. And he claims in get land equivalent ratio of about 1.6, 80% of the yield of wheat, 80% of the yield of the uh, soybeans. The other thing that inspired me on this one is that the most difficult part of strip cropping is the combining because you need a very small combine and the very small combine also has a small hopper. So you need some sort of chaser bin or something um, to keep going to it because it's gonna get filled, filled up. So I was thinking, how could you have a strip cropping system but harvest it with a conventional combine? And you want something that you could just combine over the top of like these soybeans. Um, soya is a bit of a marginal crop in the UK. So I was thinking, what else could we use? So I used a, um, a clover and vetch and lucerne mix suitable for countryside stewardship options, the um, legume fallow AB15 in the countryside stewardship. So the idea is you've got strips of clover, strips of wheat, strips of clover, strips of wheat. You go straight over the clover when you're harvesting. The clover is there, left there for two years. So you're only farming half the half the land. You're only using half the inputs, but you should get more than half the yield. And the other half is building soil fertility, similar to having a two year clover lay. I'd also been inspired by the innovative farmers program where they've been doing living mulches, where direct drilling cereals straight into living clover strips. But then they've got the problem of competition, as we've seen with the mixed intercropping, where you've got two species growing together, they're going to compete. So what happens if you keep them apart, but in the same field? So that's what we did. You can see after the harvest of the spring wheat, the clover is there growing away, it's harvesting sunlight. The rest of the field is just bare stubble, that's harvesting no sunlight. So the sunlight has been harvested, it's being used to produce car, um, fixed carbon going down into the soil, feeding the soil biology. And there's a picture of the, the clover in September, looking very, very pretty. So we've done this again, um, winter wheat this time into the, uh, the cropping strips, and then possibly we'll flip them over um, this autumn after the clover's been down there for, for two years. And you can see from this picture taken in this, this spring, there are quite a few weeds in the clover patches, but one debate is, are they weeds? Where you've got things like plantain with deep roots and deep tap roots, that's actually not a weed, it's not competing with the, uh, the crop. We've got some thistles there, which could be a problem, but if we mow the clover strips, prevent any weeds from setting seeds, we're meaning they're not going to be competing with the crop. Maybe their deep tap roots are going to be useful. You can also see at the end of the strips where the wheat crop has failed because of the water logging, the clover strips are still there. So rather than seeing whole fields just bare, this sort of system, half the field still has a, a green plant growing in there despite the, the water logging. Um, alternating strips here are X days, which is the one on the left, 
and oak farm population, which is a composite cross population. So that's a, another interest of mine is using uh, diverse populations. And you see that's looking quite vigorous as well. So our conclusion from strip cropping is that it does allow relay cropping. It removes that problem of having to sow and harvest crops at the same time, it removes the need for post harvest separation. The equipment that we've got has enough precision to spray and harvest separately. So it was very impressive the way that we didn't kill the beans. And then when we came to harvest, we didn't have contamination from one strip to the other. And potentially the clover strip idea could provide um, continuous soil cover, the same idea as a living mulch, but without the problems of competition. So some acknowledgements, um, especially Ashley Roberts, my PhD researcher working on the Crop Diva project. Uh, Mike Gutteridge, who is an uh, engineer who's made everything happen with the hands-free hectare equipment and the strip cropping. Uh, Kit Franklin, Jonathan Gill, James Lowenberg de Burr, who were developing the concepts behind the hands-free hectare. Crop Diva, of course, and Innovate UK for funding the work that we're doing uh, with AR Revolutions. And I'll just finish off with a plug. Nicola Randall and I, Harper Adams, we've got a PhD on strip cropping with the Midlands Integrated Bioscientist Bioscience Training Partnership. Uh, that will be advertised fairly shortly, so keep an eye out uh, for that one. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. That was a great talk. Um, I think there's, a, from what I can see, there's loads of questions coming through the chat. Um, yep. So I um, I don't know if people want to ask the questions themselves or if they're happy for me just to read them out and then you can chip in if you like. Okay, so the first one um, was from Robbie. Um, Thank you for a nice talk. And he said, he's asking, do you have a feel for the scale of improvements that could be made in ELER or any other measurement by breeding peas and barley specifically for mixed intercropping systems? Very good question. And uh, yeah, I think there could be improvements if we're going, if by specifically breeding for, um, for intercropping. Interestingly, some of the highest yielding varieties of sole crops like uh, Oak Ruby do work quite well with intercropping because each plant is less comp competitive. So when you're breeding sole crops, you breed, you, it's group selection. Um, so potentially we, we're already on the road there. Uh, we're doing a, an extra experiment this year, looking at um, maple peas as one of the treatments. So difference in competition of the peas. Because um, I believe they, Adrian Newton quite found quite big differences between pea varieties, but maybe not between barley varieties. Um, but we've got quite a lot more diversity in the barley varieties that we're using with the hullus barley. Some of them have got um, parentage from Syria and Switzerland and various other places. Um, various other varieties I used in the in the crosses that I did to introduce the higher beta glucan and the naked trait. Thanks, Ed. Um, Julian um, from MAGB is asking a question, which I guess probably a lot of us were thinking about, about um, the grain quality with intercropping in terms of for malting. Um, and how how would that all work? You know, have you looked at like a, like a malting variety and how well that would work with intercropping? Yeah, um, again, very good question. Last year we had Laureate as one of the varieties in the intercropping. Um, we did look at nitrogen levels. Haven't got the data just to hand, but that's one thing we could look at. Um, so yeah, mm -hmm. that is a that is a consideration. So we we mainly been focused on the naked barley for the for the human food as part of the crop diva specific, specifically, but. Um, um, I know also, from. Sorry. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, I think other people who've done experiments with milling wheat tend to get higher protein, 
So obviously that could, that could be a problem for barley if you're going to get higher higher nitrogen. Um, so Robbie also asked about whether you've done any things like um, looked at uh, greenhouse gas emissions um, from the different combinations um, across years and varieties. Not yet. That's something we'd love to do. Um, we're getting some equipment um, for part of another project uh, looking at greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm trying to persuade people to, uh, if we use it on some of the intercropping experiments as well, that would be a really interesting experiment to do. Um, George is asking um, whether when you do your different trials, whether you're using different widths of plots and how that would affect um, your intercropping results. Uh, yeah, I think it probably would affect the results. Um, it's just a case we can't do it, can't do everything. Um, so, yeah, um, different width plots would 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 have an impact. So we, we're just trying to. We're just keeping that as just all the same for all the all the intercropping experiments. Okay. Um, the next question is from Doug Christie, um, and uh, Doug's asking whether you cut and remove mulch from your clover strips, maybe to promote increased nitrogen. Uh, again, we, we've cut. We haven't removed, but that would be very interesting to look at. That's a, that's a very good idea. Um, I know other people have have done it looking at managing clover lays. If you keep removing the material, you encourage the clover to keep um, fixing more. Um, Doug, have you? Is that something you do on your farm? I don't know if Doug's still here. Yep. He may be um, no, I haven't tried it, but it's it's on the to do list, <laughs> which is very long. <laughs> okay, um, Robbie, I think you've got another question. Why don't you ask it for a change? <laughs> Which question would that be? Is it a danger? Oh, I'm going to end up reading it. Oh, yeah, okay. I, just a simple question. Um, you mentioned that there was a lack of active ingredients for controlling um, fungal or pest diseases in the, certainly the broadleaf crops. Is there a danger that that's a death knell for intercropping? With a decrease in the number of active ingredients becoming on or coming onto the market. Yes, yeah, it is a it is a problem. Um, potentially, if there's so few things you can use, say for herbicides on peas, where it may make it very very difficult to grow peas as a sole crop. In which case, you may have to use intercropping as a way of suppressing the weeds. Hmm. Okay. So you de definitely. definitely do get fewer weeds in the intercrop than the sole crop peas with equivalent levels of herbicides. Okay, so a positive perspective. Yeah, yeah. So you you, you can look at it two two ways. The, the, there is a real worry at the moment with pulses, the lack of crop protection products. Um, overall, so yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think Doug, you asked a question whether what would be the ideal width of the strips, and I guess um, I don't know if you've got an answer to that, um, Ed. Yeah, about a meter. <laughs> we're we're going for two. We're doing two meters um, mm -hmm. because that's the width of the existing equipment, but roughly about a meter. Uh, I did some desk research uh, for a. Uh, the previous project uh, for Innovate UK with Dale Holloway. And it's very interesting. There was some work at Vargening and on strip width together with Chinese researchers, and they showed that about a metre is the optimum. And that was the same width as Chinese farmers have been using in maize and wheat relay cropping for the last 500 years or so. Um, so it's a traditional practice in China, um, but dying out because of more mechanization. Um, and the Chinese researchers were worried that they were losing something that could be, you know, a big advantage. Um, so how can we 
maintain strip cropping in a world of mechanization, well, that's where the robots come in. But about a meter is probably the optimum. Okay. Um, next question is from um, a colleague of ours, um, Sidslo Berkeley Smith, who works at the Organic Innovation. I can never get this one right. An innovation organic organic innovation institute in um, Denmark in Aarhus. And um, Sidslo, do you want to ask these questions, or are you happy for me to read? Uh, you can go ahead and ask. Okay. <laughs> um, so, quick. Sizzle has a couple of questions for you. Um, first of all, um, did you assess the P nodule activity under the various nitrogen rates? Uh, yes, we did. We didn't find much differences. There was quite low levels of nodulation when it was very dry. It's something we're going to do again. Okay. Um, uh Actually, the second question was, do you think the variety in intercropping interaction is greater affected by the barley variety than the pea variety? Very good question. Previous researchers have shown that the pea variety had the biggest effect. Um, I suspect it probably will be pea variety because you've got huge differences in growth habit. For example, uh, maple peas are being very leafy. But we're going to find that out this year. So embedded in the plots for this year, we're going to use the competitive barley and the less competitive barley factorially with the more competitive and less competitive pea. That was uh, Ashley's idea. He wanted to do it. So we're going to have a go with some maple peas this year as well. So watch this space. But um, so previously it had been found that the pea variety was more important, but We've we've got more diversity in the barley as well in our experiment. Okay, and uh, Sidsel's last question is about what they actually do in Denmark, and they intercrop peas and oats for a gluten a gluten free option, um, but still has the beta glucan benefits. So, what's the main advantage of using naked barley over oats? Uh, we've got some oats trials as well. We're finding that the oats are a bit more competitive than the barley. So there we're getting lower pea yields in the oat and pea trials. Um, and also personal prejudice, I prefer barley to oats. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so that, 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 um, that one. <laughs> yeah, but the, there are some advantages to oats. For example, they are a, a better break crop um, take all. So of course, barley, barley can um, be a, a host of take all, whereas oats, uh, um, take all suppressive. Okay, and I think we've just got another two or three more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Um, James, would you like to ask your question if you're online? Uh, sure, I can. Uh, Good. I was uh, just wondering, because I think you said earlier that uh, the when you were looking at the pea barley intercrop uh, and you wanted to maximize your yields of barley, that the intercrop was less effective than a sole crop with uh, nitrogen application. And I was just wondering if that was only looking at yields or if any agronomic concerns were looked at regarding the costs of intercropping versus the cost of fertilizer usage. Yeah. So if you just if your only metric is yield, then yeah, the the barley sole crop with the higher rate of nitrogen. Um, but it would be very interesting to do some economic analysis. Um, that's potentially a, a sort of final chapter for Ashley to work on. Um, some economic analysis on the uh, the prices of the uh, the fertilizer. Obviously, that's got a lot more expensive. So yeah, it is something that we we need to look at. Yeah, and then there's a couple of comments. Um... Doug, maybe you want to um, say what your in, your experience of um, separating peas and and barley. Uh, yeah, just a very quick comment. It was just somebody asked from the um, um, on the malting scenario. I found no difference in the nitrogen content. So I was a bit worried about the nitrogen content in malting barley with the pea companion crop. Um, that it might be a bit high. 
but it was the same as as a monocrop that year. The nitrogen was the same, but with a a, a third. I think it was a quarter of the nitrogen applied. So, um, and that resulted in the same amount of um, nit um, nitrogen within the barley um, crop. Also, the big problem I had was split. I think Ed, Ed mentioned it earlier on. Oh, what a fantastic seminar, Ed, it's great. Um, Thank you. Um, it was the split peas within, after I separated the barley and the peas, the split peas were the problem. And I had to get a gravity separator, separator at great cost to separate the split peas from the barley um, to be able to send it away for for malting. Otherwise, I didn't see any problems, other, other problems at all with, with growing an intercrop barley pea um, combination. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. That's, that's something other farmers have found. If if you only want one component, say the peas, it's a lot easier than trying to set, um, get two good components out of it. Uh, for example, Mark Lee in Shropshire, he grows peas for Hodmodods. One of the things that he's done, because he, he needs to separate, he needs to clean the peas anyway to get the split ones out. So he was growing peas with triticale. So you've got the cleaned peas, cleaned whole peas, and then split peas and triticale who can be used for animal feed. Whereas if you're trying to get two clean streams out of it, then that's that's the problem. Okay, and um, just a couple more questions. Um, a comment from Ed Beckett that you can use a, a very low rate of eagle can be used on peas and it's clover um, safe as well. Um, Carlos Lopez is asking whether this could be a way to provide economic sustainability to small barley producers in countries like Colombia. Possibly. <laughs> don't I don't have enough knowledge of. Yeah. Um, and then um, last co question is: In a commercial farm context, could management of crop rotations uh, um, uh, be a potential difficulty with strip cropping? So I guess that's a comparison between whether rotations are, you know, how that works with a strip crop or what question that's from. Yeah, well, it, 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 yeah, each strip would have its own rotation or so you'd rotate within the strips. Uh, for example, our two years, the, the plots that were wheat last year are barley this year, the plots that were beans last year are wheat this year, and the plots that were beans last year become wheat this year remember yeah yeah so you do a, a rotation within the strips brilliant um does anybody have any questions they want to ask if they want to unmute that's us finish with the questions in the chat can't see anybody putting their hand up um if not um we'd just like to thank ed for a really interesting oh uh talk doug have you got your hand up or are you waving uh, yes, yeah, just a very quick question. Sorry, I'm, I'm quite interested in this subject, but on the strip cropping, would you, if you're doing it in within a rotation, would you the following year you do do the direction, the, the direction of the, the of the strips and say it's north, south one year, would you do it east, west the following year? Um, no, no, you, no, do, you, you, exactly you keep the, the strips in place. So you can imagine the strips almost like permanent beds. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, and then that, that way you're also doing CTF. Yeah, so, you know, control traffic farming. So you're not um, potentially not trafficking most of the field. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, everyone, and thanks, Ed. That was great. Um, if anybody has any more questions for Ed, they can um, find his email on the Harper Adams website. Um, George has got a question. Go, George. Sorry, pressed the wrong uh, emoji. <laughs> Are you clapping instead? <laughs> okay, no, well, thanks very much, everyone, and thanks, Ed. See you next yeah. time. Bye. Thanks, Ed. Well done. Thanks a lot. Yep, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Right.